and hold on. At our church, we love God. Make no mistake about that. At our church, we believe in God's radical, unconditional, and unwavering love for us. At our church, we believe that Jesus is God. We also affirm that you may or may not believe that Jesus is God. And we're not asking you to change your belief system before you attend our church. We're simply inviting you on a journey toward Jesus. For years, churches have placed a high priority on Jesus as the get out of hell free card. At our church, we place the highest priority on Jesus as a live life to the fullest invitation. At our church, we believe every person has a dream deep inside their hearts and that God put that dream there, not for our glory, but for his. At our church, we're not concerned with where you've been, but where you're going. At our church, we believe that the Bible is God's word. It is real, it is living, it is active. We believe that people who don't go to church anywhere are not the enemy. They are real people who need the perfect love that only God can give. And we believe that God gives this love through, of all people, us. At our church, we do not and we will not display a holier-than-thou attitude toward anyone. We are all broken people, but he is putting us back together. And finally, and most importantly, at our church, we believe that Jesus really lived, that he really died on the cross, and that he really rose again on the third day. And we cannot and we will not candy coat or water down that message, ever. Today, you've chosen to sit yourself in the middle of a very safe place to hear a potentially dangerous message. Welcome to our church. to what we call the season of Lent, and we are excited to announce that we will be doing our interfaith Ash Wednesday here in the building, March 3rd, at uh, the Lutheran Church right next to the high school, the big hall. Um, so that'll be about, probably about 6.30, I'll need more details, but March 3rd, we'll do the interfaith uh, um, Ash Wednesday service that we've done in the past, and so please join us for that, and uh, that'll be, it'll probably be between 6 and 6.30. We'll be looking at some gospel passages from now until then, and uh, the gospel readings have been very challenging for me this week. I, I told Ben that I'm, it was one of those weeks that I'm excited to share this message, but I was also not real excited to have to deal with it. He was poking and prodding and taking some, some liberties that I don't remember giving him. So, uh, so whenever you feel like I'm yelling at you, just know that I didn't yell that all week. Uh, but no, we're, I, I'm excited about where we're going this, these next few weeks after this. Father in heaven, we come before you today acknowledging your presence in this world in awe of your movement in this world. We ask that you continue to just be more than we can ever expect or imagine or put in a box. This morning as we worship, Lord, through music, through your word, through fellowship together, Lord, we just ask that you mingle in every aspect of that and that we recognize your name in it. Bring us the comfort that we need. Bring us the challenge that we desire. Bring us the opportunity to grow. In your name, in your good name. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with us? Can you hear me?
seated and as you do I want you to think back for those of you that attended a Sunday school class when you were kids and and uh, they maybe broke out that high high dollar technology of the flannel graph and they if you don't know what a flannel graph is it's like, it's like like flannel and then they cut out pictures of flannel to stick on the flannel to tell you stories using a flannel you, you know what though it never glitched Flannel always sucked to flannel. There was never a time that the internet was down. You're like, can't do flannel graphs today. Um, there was a song that was a popular Sunday school song. I, I taught Sunday school in children's church in Oklahoma and in Sparks for a long time. And I've, uh, this, this passage that we're looking at today is in every curriculum every single year. It doesn't matter what, what age group you teach in Sunday school. But you may remember this song that says, I will make you fishers of men, fishers of men. Do you remember that? Yeah, <laughs> Diana's singing it now. Go, go, I'll get you a mic. You keep going. Um, th this song about this calling of the first disciples, this, this, this monumentous moment in the birth of the church has been, it's, it's used two out of the three years in the lectionary cycle, just in different books. This is, we're going to look at Luke's account today. And there's this, this, this story of importance that goes along with this whole thing. 
Now, I've been doing this a little while, and I've only read and preached this or heard it preached one way. And this week, everything kind of, um, it kind of shifted. Now, I just want to remind us that a lot of times we get into problems because we read our Bibles to ourselves quietly. Scripture was never meant to be read by yourself quietly. Scripture was always meant to be read aloud. It was meant to be read in a group. It was meant to be read and talked about and articulated. Now, I'm not saying don't read your Bibles. Maybe read it out loud. Because something happens when you hear Scripture that you don't always get when you're just reading Scripture. And this, this time, I read through this passage of Scripture, and I read it out loud. I always read it out loud. I, I meet with the group on Monday. We read the Scripture out loud. And something happened when they read it out loud this time. And I never really understood the fact that when the person that's reading Scripture, how much power they actually have in how you hear the Scripture. I, I don't know if there's any people in here that have ever watched the show Friends. But there's a character named Phoebe in Friends. And Phoebe does this thing throughout the whole thing. It's kind of like a running joke throughout the entire thing of Friends where she'll say something one way and then she realizes how hard it was and so she'll rephrase the same thing. Like, for instance, if you were to say to someone, you got that job? Oh, you got that job. (laughs) Right? Just in the way that we can say things, we can change the meaning of entire sentences. And I think that that we've done this, well, I've done this with this passage in Luke. Luke chapter 5 is where we're going to be today. This Luke chapter 5, this calling of the first disciples. And I think we do it because someone told us early on in church history that Peter was a loud mouth that always said the wrong thing. And so then whenever Peter talks, we always read Peter as like this guy who's just always flying off the handle and saying things we don't understand. And he's just kind of a hothead, you know. And so we've, we've kind of pigeonholed Peter into this, this guy that you don't know. He's a loose cannon, that Peter. He's going to say some weird stuff. So then every time we read him, it's like this guy that's just saying things that are flippant, and we don't, we don't really listen for a new voice of Peter. But today I hope that maybe we hear a new voice of Peter. So let's look at Luke chapter 5, verse 1 through 11. It goes like this. It says, One day Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret. The people were crowding around him and listening to the word of God. Now this is important. Because this is one of those things that I never really grasped until I watched The Chosen. And in watching The Chosen, you realize we, do, we're, we're, we just started watching it in youth group and we're doing small group discussions based on it. And one of the cool things about it is we got about 45 minutes into the first episode and Jesus hasn't even shown up yet. There's like this whole long thing of, of making sure we understand that there was Andrew and Peter and John and James and Matthew long before Jesus ever got into town. These people had lives. They were living their lives. They were fishing. They were t- tax collecting. They were doing everything they do long before Jesus enters the story. And so we, we often, I think, we, we read Scripture as if Jesus was just always there. Like he was just around, right? I mean, it, Jesus, was uh, he's never been not around for us. So it's hard for us to put a time where people lived before Jesus declared to be Messiah in Jesus' generation. And so it's important for us to understand that Jesus was already there. <clears throat> he was already preaching. He was already sharing this message when this story happens. I think I've always read into this story that this is the first encounter that Peter and James and John and in the rowboat. There's another Sunday school song. Um, that this is the first time they've ever encountered Jesus. Like, I think we've always done this thing where all of a sudden Jesus just appears on the beach and calls Peter, and Peter just drops everything and follows him. But it says that one day Jesus was already standing there by the, gate, by the lake, and people were crowding around him listening to the word. In verse 2, he says, He saw at the water's edge two boats left there by the fishermen who were washing their nets. So we have two boats. We could assume one was Peter and Andrew's boat, and one was James and John's boat. Right, because we assume that because they're the ones that come into the story later, and so they're done fishing for the night and they're cleaning their nets. They're getting all, they're getting everything fixed to put away. And Jesus notices them over there as Jesus is holding church. Right, he's holding a meeting over here. He's he's preaching this new gospel. People are all around him. It's very crowded. Which, by the way, just from my perspective, it's pretty rude of Peter and Andrew. That's that's distracting. I mean, can you do it down the way? Anyway, he got into one of the boats. 
the one belonging to Simon, who would later become Peter, and asked him to put out a little, far, a, little, a little from shore. Then he sat down and taught the people from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down the nets for a catch. And Simon answered, I'm going to read this a couple different ways. Because this is where I got, this is where, I don't know, if new vision or epiphany or whatever it was. But listen to this. This is how I've always read this. Simon answered, Master, <laughs> we've worked hard all night long, and we've caught nothing. And I've translated it like this. You're a carpenter. I'm a fisherman. I don't tell you how to build a table. You don't tell me how to catch fish. Right, because that's how, th- th- this is who I've been introduced to as Peter is, right? Peter is the one that's always going to just come out and say what he's thinking. And so I've always read it, like, Master, we've worked hard all night and we haven't caught anything. But because you say so, because you say so, I'll let down the nets. Now, the Chosen does a really good job of depicting this scene, I think. It's in the first couple episodes and they, they, they have this thing where, Peter and Andrew are already kind of talking about this guy Jesus, right? It's not like he just appeared on the scene. They've already been kind of talking about this message that's, that's different, that's new, that's kind of revolutionary. And the way that he, that he brings forth and he speaks with such, such authority and all that. So they, they depict him already having these conversations and kind of setting a baseline for Peter just didn't like, here's my boat. Jesus says, can I use your boat? He's like, sure, you have my boat. And then Jesus says, okay, to go out and fish some more. And he's like, ah, you know, this is not some strange person that has just walked into the scene. This is someone that they've already seen. They've already been talking about. The rumors have been flying around. And he says, but because you say so, I will let down the nets. Well, something happened on Monday with the person that read the scripture. And I heard it in a totally different light. He read it like this. He said, Simon answered, Master, We've been fishing all night, and I haven't caught anything. But because you say so, I'll let down the nets. It was just this softer tone than he read it with that made me remember, for me, I heard it through the lens of I'm still pastoring in a pandemic. We're still trying to figure out how to navigate all these things. We're still trying to figure out what's the right thing and the wrong thing and how we... And master, I'm tired. I've been doing this for two years, and I've caught nothing. And it just, it it totally changed the way that I've entered into this scripture. That Peter is not just this loudmouth that's arguing and being sassy with Jesus. He's exhausted. He's been fishing all night long, and he's caught nothing. Now, that's not like when... I. I am one to say that a bad day fishing is better than a good day at work, right? Because at least you're out there, you're on the water. You're, no, this is his job. This, if he doesn't catch anything, his family doesn't know where they're going to get eat, where they're going to get food or money, right? This is a commercial job. This is not just him out hiking with a fly pole and be like, oh, this is a nice little spot. Oh, I didn't catch anything. Oh, well, at least I was outside. This is how he provides. So, so he just had a defeated moment in his life where he has been out all night fishing and he's come in to the realization that he's got nothing to take to market that day. And he has to understand this idea that the nets are empty. And so when Jesus approaches him and goes through all this stuff, go out a little deeper, throw your nets in. Man, I'm tired. I just want to go home and go to bed. I just want to get, look, if we do that, even if we don't catch anything, we have to come back in and clean the nets again. Like, you're not just talking about go out there and throw, but he's talking about go out deeper. So now we get to row out further, throw nets in, not catch anything, and then clean the nets again and get less sleep and go out and do it again tonight. This moment is so much bigger than all of that. So so when I hear Peter respond with, (laughs) We've been out all night. We, we haven't caught anything. But this message that you're preaching, this message that you have, this authority that you speak with, because of that, 
Because of that, I, I'm going to do it. I always thought he was trying to prove Jesus wrong. I, I always thought that Peter was, and, and it, I, I think that both readings are okay. Because we don't have stage directions in, in the margins. There's no italics that says Peter was doing this when he read this. There's no director saying, hey, here's your motivation. But I just think it's interesting, and maybe it's just after these two years and me being tired <laughs> that I read it and hear it differently this time. But I always thought it was like, oh, because you say so, I'll go do it. And then when I get back, I'm going to go, <laughs> told you so. Verse 6. When they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish, their nets began to break. So they signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came, and they filled both boats so full that they began to sink. When Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. We talked a little bit about this with Jeremiah last week. Remember Jeremiah's response to God calling him was like, I'm too young for that. What are you, crazy? I can't go into the, to, to the, to the scribes and the Pharisees and tell them they're doing something wrong. I'm, I'm young. We have the same thing with Moses when God calls Moses and he says, I, I'm not that good at speaking. I, 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 you, you got the wrong person. And then when, when, when God has the nerve to call Gideon, Gideon's response is, not only am I from the lowest tribe, but I'm the lowest man from that tribe. Surely you have the wrong person. And now we have, we have this, this situation with Peter where if he was trying to come back and told you, I told you so, he ate a whole lot of humble pie on the way back, fell at Jesus' knees and said, get away from me. Get, get, can you go back to verse 7? It says, uh, filled both boats and begin to sink. And then Simon Peter, anyway, it says, <laughs> he says, get away from me. He was, he was there was a sense of, of awe is the best word for it. And Luke loves this word, amazing or awestruck. We, we, we say awesome. I had a, uh, some, when I worked with the youth group in Sparks, we had the, some of our sponsors wouldn't let the kids use the word awesome. They weren't allowed to use the word awesome because there was only one thing that's awesome, and that's God. And they, wanted to, they, they always hammered that point in. It's like a few years ago, the word epic was the word. Everything was epic. And I remember one time we were down at, we were down at San Diego at Elevate, and a kid said, I just had the most epic salad. Okay, never in the world of anything is a salad ever going to be epic. It could be a great salad, but an epic salad, right? And that, that, that's this idea. This, it, it, uh, Luke talks about, that uses this word awestruck and, and awe-inspiring and in awe with this amazing birth that happens, right? And, and, and these amazing things, this pregnancy. They, they, you use it throughout the whole thing, this amazing God that goes after the one, this, this amazing thing. And, and Luke loves this idea of making everything amazing that's around God. And so Peter just reacts. He says, you need to go away from me, Lord. I, I, I'm a sinful man. And then, he, and then this is, and then in verse 9, he says, For he and all his companions were astonished. That word astonished is, is amazing and awe. They were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee. Which, by the way, I really wish my dad's name was Thunder. That's what Zebedee means, right? They're the sons of Thunder. Which is also kind of, that's a lot to live up to <laughs> When you're the sons of thunder and you're just kind of, well, whatever. The sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. For now, for now on, I will, you will fish for people. Don't be afraid. For now on, you will fish for people. So there's something with this, this link of the word astonishment or amazing or awesome that is followed up by God with don't be afraid. When the angels came to the shepherds, they were astonished, and they were in awe, and the angel says, don't be afraid. When the angel shows up to Mary, she was astonished, she was in awe, and the angel says, don't be afraid. So many times I get people ask me, why, 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 will this, why do I have to fear God? Like the fear of God is just a weird, is he like this, this weird tyrant that comes down to always like condemn and blast us? And why, why is he so terrifying? And I think that Luke does a good job of keeping these phrases together with astonishment and fear. Don't fear. 
I know you're astonished, but don't fear. And the way that I, the best way I could picture this is if, if you've ever been somewhere like the Grand Canyon or the cliffs at Point Loma where you can walk right to the edge of the sunset cliffs where they tell you not to, and you can look over and know to yourself, this is amazing and I could die. You're just blown away by the fact that this cliff just drops straight down. And then down there, there's this vast ocean and people surfing and kelp coming up. And, and then you, maybe you go to like, I, I don't know, up in Northern California and you stand on those same cliffs and the waves are just violent. They just crash against it and the spray goes everywhere. You can just, you're just enamored by the, the, the awesomeness of how rough and violent that ocean is. And yet you know that if you take one bad step, you're not going to make it. There's this, this, this awesomeness and this, this, this wonder that comes inside of us as we look at what God has done. But then we can also step back and realize that this is also very, very dangerous. I, I imagine that people that go down in those shark cages voluntarily and they, they get lower down, there's this sense of adrenaline that, oh my gosh, we're going to see a shark. Not only that, but it's going to bite that bar that's only four inches from my face. And, and then all of a sudden, they see that shark, right? They see the great white for the first time, and it's coming and it's swimming around them. And they're like, oh my gosh, this is exactly what I signed up for. This is amazing. Look at that thing. And then all of a sudden, it comes and crashes into the cage, and you realize, oh my gosh, that's a shark. And I don't know that I trust the, this contraption anymore. Can we go up? This is this moment that Peter is just blown away by the fact that not only did he not catch anything the night before, but they don't fish in the daytime because they don't catch fish in the daytime. And he didn't just fill his boat. He had to call in reinforcements to get his boat filled. And then they came in, and this is the funniest picture to me, is that they're both trying to row in. They've got their sails up there because their boat is sinking because they have so much fish. Go out deeper and then throw your nets in because then you're going to have longer to go while you sink on the way back in. Right? <laughs> the whole call is just strange. And so they get back in, and Jesus, Peter finds Jesus and falls at his knees and says, Master, get away from me. I, I, I am a sinful man. And Jesus' response is, don't be afraid. Oh, you should be in wonder. <laughs> you should be blown away because what just happened was miraculous. But don't be afraid because from now on, I'm going to make you fishers of people. Uh, I, I, I can only equate this to playing some kind of sport. And, and the sport that is most relatable to this, and since there's no real football today, it's just the Pro Bowl, that doesn't count. We'll, we'll use a football analogy here. I don't care what team you're on and how exhausted you are. If you're a defense and spit on the field for like six, seven straight minutes and they're just crushing you and you're just exhausted, hands on hips, sucking air, you cannot go any further. If your team intercepts that ball and returns it to the end zone, you are feeling fine. Every bit of exhaustion is over. Everything, momentum shifts. You're jumping up and down. You couldn't even run back to the line of scrimmage just three seconds ago. But now you run 80 yards down the field with your buddy because you've got this shot of adrenaline that's changed everything. This is, Lord, we have been fishing all night and caught nothing. But if you say to go, we'll go. I guarantee when Peter and, and, and Andrew and James and John and Thunder himself, they, they're rowing back in, I guarantee they're not tired. I guarantee they're rowing faster than they've ever rowed before. And I guarantee as they get back in and Peter looks at Jesus, there is this, this adrenaline that's in him, this, this spike of, of excitement, this, this newness, this ready to take on everything. And he falls at Jesus' feet, not because of, he just, he's just blown away by what just happened. 
And there is no, and I guarantee that they went home and they told their wives, you're never going to guess what happened. And their wives are probably like, what's going on? Usually you come in and go right to sleep. I'm trying, I got stuff to do. And they walk in and they say, you're not going to believe this. But, but Jesus, the one that's been, everyone's talking about, he, he, he borrowed my boat. And then, and then for payment, he told me to go out and go fishing some more. And I was like, we're tired. And he's like, just go out a little further and cast out. And babe, we caught so much fish that we had to call in James and John to help us get the fish back into shore. And I promise you that sleep did not come easy that day because they were so amped up. When just earlier that day, a couple hours earlier, They were so exhausted from being out all night with no returns. Something happens when you see God move and returns happen. The culture is a little different now, but it wasn't too long ago where churches held revival services. And you would bring in an evangelist and they would come in and they would speak three, four, five nights and then usually close everything up on Sunday. And churches paid exuberant amounts for this. In fact, it, 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 to just be honest, it's one of the reasons why Julie and I toyed with the idea of doing evangelism in the early on because evangelists, evangelists got paid really, really well to just stir stuff up and then leave. And so they would come in and they would do this thing and, and they would call it a revival and, and usually by Sunday, they've, 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 de- they've taken the congregation on this journey every night. And then on Sunday, they bring this gospel message that just saves everything. That, that offers you this hope that you didn't know was there. And so they've invited everyone to come back and they, they do this amazing thing. And all of a sudden, for the next two months, the church is different. The energy is different. The, the, there, there's something going on that's just, it's just different. And then about... Two months and two weeks after the revival, everything kind of slumps back down and people start getting used to it and they go back into their old routines and everything starts happening again. And it's like, you remember, oh, I'm so exhausted. And you forget that you literally just brought in two huge boats of fish. But while it's going on, oh my gosh, there's nothing better. There's something that takes place When God calls you to do something and you say yes and then in the midst of it this great reward takes place. There's nothing there's nothing more rejuvenating about it than than that. The first time you talk to a friend about Jesus and they respond positively or when you invite them to church and they say, oh yeah, I'm going to go. You don't know how many texts and emails and calls I get throughout the week. I invited so-and-so to church. They're going to be there Sunday. And here's my problem. No, they're not. They probably told you that so that you would stop inviting them to church this week. That's the first place I go. And then what I see a lot is they come and, and they're so excited because their friend's going to come to church and they sit on, on an aisle seat and they, every time someone comes in, they look, they look, There's this excitement. And then when the person they invite doesn't come, there's this huge letdown. And you're like, I fished all night and I caught nothing. And JJ is going to get up there and tell me to go fish some more. But I'm so tired. I'm so tired. And this hit me harder than ever this time because I'm tired. And because I talk with people every day. And I have conversations with teachers that are tired. I I have conversations with students that are tired. With doctors that are tired. With nurses that are tired. That they just keep looking at going, for two years I fished all night and I'm tired. I've got nothing. Conversations with people that work retail that, that for some reason 
most people feel like they're, they're just there to serve us and do whatever we want them to do, and we don't really care how they really feel about anything. And they're tired. People that work in jobs where they, they're just, they, they, they feel like that they're just simply a number. And it doesn't matter, just, just show up. That's what we need you to do right now. We need you to show up and do the job of 15 people because only 14 showed up. We need you to do more work. And so it's not just me and it's not just Peter. We're tired. And the sad thing is we're tired and we don't see the interception right now. There's like such a little hope for a pick six that we don't even really celebrate anything. There, There are so many things in my brain and at least a quarter of them make some sense. But, the, but there are things that I want to try and I'm terrified to because I'm afraid that next week we're just going to have to shut it down. Or that, or, or that I'm going to get tired or that so-and-so is going to, or they can't. It, it, it just everything that I think of in my mind right now goes through this, this thing of, I've been fishing all night and caught Nothing. And for some reason, for the past year, I've stopped reading the gospel there. And I think this week I realized that God is saying, you need to hear what Peter said. I fished all night and caught nothing, but if you say so, I'll go try again. I'll go try it again. And I love this imagery of the the way that the thing... the song, I Will Make You Fishers of Men. If you, if you had a very active Sunday school teacher, you learned this too. I will make you fishers of men, fishers of right? But the Bible says, I will make you fishers of men. Where we're throwing out a net, where we're going to catch a bunch of stuff. They're not just pulling fish in. They're pulling John's soda can. I don't think John really drank soda. Hi, Ben. (laughs) But they're pulling in the garbage that surrounded everything. They're pulling everything in because they cast this huge net and they went out a little deeper than they normally go. And they did what Jesus asked them to do even when they were in the midst of exhaustion because somehow along the line, Peter realized something. That he was not waiting for a Savior that was going to condemn and terrify. But the Savior that Peter was waiting for was a Savior that was coming to call and to walk alongside of. Because God does not enter our lives to terrify us. He enters our life to call and transform us. And so as we begin to to navigate what that looks like. And we ask God, what do you want me to do? Like, what are the things? Do we even know what's out there? We, we've been toying around with this idea of on fifth Sundays, rather than gathering in here and having a service, but finding a service project somewhere in the community to do on that Sunday and then gather back here for a potluck afterwards. That's, that's been something that I've been sharing with the board for a while. And then it hit me the other day, well, what, if, what if we did something similar to that, except for the fact that what if we brought in people that are doing community things and let them share with you what they're doing? It's still a service Sunday, right? Because do we know what's going on in our community? Do, do, do we know what's happening? Because A- Peter and Andrew did. They knew that Jesus was walking around and Jesus was doing this teaching. They knew that he was a rabbi. They knew that he as a rabbi was going to end up calling disciples because that's what rabbis do. So when, Peter, when, when Jesus said, come follow me, it wasn't, it, it wasn't odd to them. They, they knew this was happening. So are we not involved because we don't know what's going on? I think that's fair. I think so many of us, we, we don't know the opportunities that are out there. So when, when, Jesus, when, when Jesus says, I'm going to make you fishers of people, this is verse 11. It says, so they pulled their boats up on shore, left everything, and followed him. 
They even left Zebedee. Left everything and followed him. But they knew the opportunity. They knew where they could plug in. They, they, they knew what it was that they could get involved with that's changing this world. And how do they know? Well, they just caught more fish than they've ever caught in their entire lives. There's something happening here, and it's awe-inspiring. And so when Jesus says, come on, I'm going to make you fishers of people, they said, yeah, all right. If that means, it, it, here's what I would have done. I would have first taken all the fish to market, sold them, then followed Jesus. Because that, that story that they went home and told their wives, and their wives said, well, where's all the money from the fish? And you, and they, and you said, um, we just left the fish there. <laughs> but they left everything. And they followed. So I think it's important for us to know that there are things going on in our community that are awesome, that are already happening. If you've never talked to Susan over at the Dream Center, she's doing amazing things. They're not off the streets. They're doing amazing things. Fish is doing amazing things. Ron Woods is doing amazing things. There are great things going on all around us. Did you know there's a house of prayer on Telegraph Street that they just gather together and pray in the building all day long? Amazing stuff. Like there, there, There's great stuff going on. But if we don't know about these opportunities, how can we be called to go into these opportunities? So we are looking, and I'm praying in a direction of God to call someone to be like a community organizer in here, just a volunteer that, that was willing to put their hands out in what's going on in the community and then come back and tell us so that we can have them come and speak on a fifth Sunday. Or we can engage in some kind of project in their building or at their, on their property or whatever. So, so we can be involved in this kind of stuff. Because God is going to call you to something. And it's going to be easy for you to say, yeah, but I don't really know how to do that. Yeah, but I don't, I don't, I don't speak so good. I'm the lowest man in the lowest tribe. I'm too young for that. I'm just a fisherman. There's excuses all over the place. And God's response is, yes, and I know you're also tired. And sometimes you're going to fish all night, you're going to catch nothing. Sometimes you're going to go to a different spot, and you're going to throw the nets, and you're going to catch more fish than you can even believe. That's what I'm calling you to, is being willing to go out again. This week I was reminded that my being tired doesn't give me an excuse to not work as if I'm working for the Lord in everything that I do. My being tired is an invitation to rely more on the one that calls us to go back out. And so I hope that in the midst of this, that you experience God call you to do something, and then you go, and you do, and you serve in a way that is terrifying. You say yes in a way that is terrifying. In the midst of, I know you're tired. So were they. And then they saw great things happen because so often, You've heard, the darkest part of the day is just before the dawn. Let's get to the dawn and accept a call from a God that longs to call us and transform us and not just condemn us and get in our face and tell us how terrible we are. But a God that wants to transform and call us to something greater. As the band comes back up and we move into connecting time, I just want to extend this invitation to all of us that are here to be able to enter into this moment of God calling us to go out where the waters a little deeper in the midst of our exhaustion. I'll just, let me just be real transparent for a second, sorry. 
I called you up and I lied. We were gathering over here to pray this morning. <laughs> ben, not meaning anything by it, <laughs> says to me, well, there are more people here last week. And I snapped back, yeah, I don't think I didn't notice that. And here's the thing. I don't know what to do about it. Right? I, 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 don't, know, I, I don't know how else to do this thing. I'm exhausted. I've been out all night. I've been doing this for, for two years this way. I'm tired. And God says, go back out. Go do it again. So now my response is, if you say so, I'll do it. Not to come back next week and go, ha ha, I told you that wouldn't work. But to just see what happens. To go back out. To do it. To see God move. To answer the call that I answered so long ago. And it's not just a call to preach. The call is to love your neighbor. The call is to be part of a community. Look, I have friends that are great activists. And I'll just tell you right now, activism that's not rooted in love your neighbor is stupid. It's just out of anger. But activism out of love your neighbor that's rooted first in your community can change everything. So the call is to love your neighbor, which, by the way, if you're sitting here, you're called to do that. Love your neighbor. Let's transform this place. As the band sings, we'll have our connecting time stations we have communion. We have the altars up here. We've got candles over there. The cross. I almost wish I would have brought like a fishing pole with those little magnet ducks. But with like Barbies, because we're fishers of people. Back here we have our chest where we receive our tithes and our offerings. We just invite you to engage. If that means you engage right where you're sitting, then engage right where you're sitting. But this morning, if you don't respond to any other call this morning, respond to this call, that God has called you to love your neighbor. And that is worth dropping your nets and following. Scary, yeah. But worth every bit of it. Come when you're ready. I told you my story, you would hear a hope, wouldn't let go. If I told you my story, you would hear love, you never gave up.
you would hear freedom there was one for me yeah. and if I told you my story you would hear life overcome the grave if I should speak you fishers of men when you follow me. I will make you fishers of men. God, God is the one calling us to do, and his scripture tells us over and over again, when he calls us to do, he is there doing with us. We are never alone. This journey is not something he has called us to f- try to figure out on ourselves. So here's what I'm going to do. This has been on my heart for a long time, and I'm going to say it out loud so I have to do it. Because I'm terrified to try this. Next week when you get here, there'll be a sign in the entryway area. It'll be where Julie and I are going to lunch that day. If you want to join us, join us. Everybody could join us. Now, let me just make this clear. We're not paying for your lunch that day. (laughs) But just an opportunity for us to be together where we'll go. And it's not, look, we're not going to go to like the steakhouse in, in the Fandango. All right, it'll be somewhere relatively affordable, and I know that's relative. But like right now, Julie doesn't know it yet, but we're going to Chipotle. So we're just going to have the opportunity for us to, after church, we'll just go to lunch together and just kind of hang out a little longer. Maybe that's me tipping my toe in because I'm going to lunch anyway. I'm just inviting you to come with me. (laughs) But I feel like, I feel like I need, I need to feel that little tug on the net. I need to know that there's at least some fish getting in this net. I need to know that there's something happening. And so, next week when you come, we'll just let you know where we're going to lunch. And if you want to join us, you can. If not, then I'm just going to eat lunch. It won't be nearly as much fun. My hope is that regardless of the call that you have, or regardless of the voice that you hear Jesus entering into your life, may you be willing to take your boat back out with the hope that something will be different. I know you're tired. We're all tired. 
go back out and let's see what happens. May you be people of faith that are rooted in hope, that are willing to throw those nets overboard one more time and have a catch be so big that you won't stop talking about it for the next two years. Because if this can make us tired, I guarantee a big catch can get us through two years. And I'm not talking about butts and pews. I'm talking about any kingdom win that you can grab. May you be people that go out willing to grab it. Have a good week. Build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. And show your mighty hand. Heal our streets and land. Set your church on fire in this nation. Kingdom